So the next thing I want to look at are superconducting shields. The superconductors are characterized by zero electrical resistivity below a, cr a critical ten transition temperature, which would be 77 Kelvin for a high temperature superconductor like YBCO. And we, we're shielding magnetic fields do, because of the Meissner effect that tends to push magnetic fields outside of superconductors. So we've gotten a, a previous webinar that you can look at and see some more examples of superconductivity. The two different types of superconductors, type 1 and type 2 superconductors, depends on the magnetization versus H. So a type 1 superconductor will have a magnetization curve that looks similar to the red curve, and a type 2 superconductor is more like the blue curve here. So we have flux penetration into a superconductor for a type 2 superconductor, whereas a type 1 superconductor will become normal after a critical exceeds a critical field HC. So today we'll just look at a type 1 superconductor. And the previous webinar, you can see how we model type 2 superconductors using quick field. So let's look at some quick field examples. Okay, this is a superconducting tube modeled in XY symmetry. This is a very similar to the, in fact, the same geometry as the mu metal that we looked at previously. If we look at the block labels, this is the air region. Okay. Now, I'm establishing a uniform field here, and I'm applying it's going to be in the vertical direction. So there's zero tangential field on the bottom. Uh, I'm assigning opposite vector potential to the left and right. These values give a rather large magnetic field. And also on the superconducting surface, I'm assigning zero vector potential. And that's the boundary condition we need to use if we have a zero field cooled superconductor. If we have a field cooled superconductor or a superconductor that doesn't have a hole in it, then we use the normal boundary condition on the magnetic field. We use zero normal magnetic field. And I'll talk a little bit more about those two boundary conditions. And you can refer to the previous webinar if you want to see that. OK. So let's go ahead and look at the solution here. OK. And we can see that the superconducting tube has screened the magnetic field a lot better than this, the same geometry for the mu metal tube. If we look at a contour, we can see that the magnetic field has been attenuated along an axial contour. And we can look at individual values in solution region. Here's the background field, roughly 5 tesla inside here. Um, it looks like about 10 to the negative 3. OK, actually, that's 10 to the minus 2 here, so a little bit better in the center. Uh, the shielding will go exponentially with the length of the tube. And if we want to do this exactly, we can also model this in axial symmetry and the shielding factor agrees very well with analytical solutions in that case. And I just want to show this for visual purposes in the, for this particular example. Now, what happens if we change the direction of the magnetic field? OK. So let's go back to the geometry. And I'm going to switch the direction of the magnetic field. And so therefore, I'm going to put 
opposite values of vector potential on the bottom and the top edges here. Okay. So this is going to change the direction of the magnetic field. On the top, I give one. Uh, on the left, we're well, well, going to make this zero tangential field. And on the right, we have zero tangential field. Okay. And let's solve this again. Okay. One thing we can see is that the shielding of the transverse factor is not quite as good as the shielding for the axial factor. And this is a property of superconductors that they're not very good at shielding transverse factors, whereas it turns out that mu metal is good for, sh for shielding the, the transverse factors a little bit better. Okay. In fact, we can compare the two for uh, different types of shielding factors. Analytical solution gives exponential dependence here. If we compare the transverse and longitudinal shielding factors, uh, for the attenuation along the axis of a superconducting tube, the axial field has a much stronger uh, shielding factor than the transverse field. And notice that if we look along the axis of a, a permeable tube with the same radius, the transverse factor for a permeable tube is the same as the actual shielding factor for a superconducting tube. And the actual shielding factor uh, is worse for a, a permeable tube. So that seems to suggest that if you wanted to have both shielding factors for axial and transverse fields, the combinations of superconducting and mu metal tubes would be one way to accomplish that. Another factor, if we look back at this simulation here, uh, we have a superconducting tube in a transverse field. If we look along the, uh, the very center of the superconducting tube here, there's going to be zero there's not going to be any Z component field along the, the exact midpoint here. All along the exact midpoint will have zero Z component field. So if I put in a magnetic sensor that, that only picks up the Z component field, I won't pick up that component. Okay. And furthermore, we can use the fact that the total flux inside of a superconducting zero field cool ring is zero. And we can find a very uh, specific location where there's zero Z component field due to a uniform field. Okay, so the, the, these are the actual shielding factors. This is calculated in axial symmetry um, for a zero field cool ring where we apply a boundary con condition of zero vector potential, whereas for the field cool ring, we apply normal B equal to zero, and that would be that would also model a, uh, a disk with a slit in it like this. For a normal state ring, obviously we have no shielding here. And I've normalized these values to the, to the background field here. Okay. So if you want to shield both axial and transverse factors, you have only a Z component pickup coil. And if you, you can locate your pickup coil at these nodal points inside of the opening of a superconducting ring, and you should be able to screen uniform fields that are distant from your source. Okay. So we're interested in other types of magnetic shields, say for biomagnetic measurements. And this is one example of a, a squid setup here for magnetoencephalography, where you have in this case, it's uh, 275 channel or 275 squids that are surrounding the whole head magnetometer um, system here, recording neuromagnetic signals. And this is just a schematic of our actual photograph of a high TC squid with a you see the pickup loop here, and the actual squid is here. This is the actual pickup loop of the squid. Okay, 
So I wanted to show a model a hemispherical shield. In fact, there's probably not a hemispherical shield in this setup. Uh, we're most likely using radiometer coils to pick up the near magnetic signal here. But I will show you a helmet type of superconducting shield that might be used for an application like this. Okay. Let me close all these. Okay. So I'll show you the first, the, the axisymmetric calculation here. And this is a magnetostatics problem. This is our geometry here. We have a superconducting bowl. This is the air region. This is our helmet. Um, the air has unit permeability. The helmet now, I'm modeling this a little bit different than I did previously because this is not a multiply connected superconductor. It's a single piece. So we can model the superconductor with a very tiny permeability. There's actually three ways we can model permeability and two types of boundary condition for superconductor. Okay. Uh, on the side, I have put an enormous flux function before. And once again, we have zero tangential fields so that we have um, a z-directed magnetic field. And I can look at the solution for this. And you can see that how the axial field is, is screened here, as well as we can look at the screening currents that are flowing on the actual shield itself. Okay, so if I look at a contour plot along the surface of the bowl, okay, this gives me the magnetic field. It actually increases towards the edge of the shield. And if I look at the field strength, okay, this gives us the supercurrent density of supercurrent that's flowing on the surface of the superconductor. Okay. So we would like to have sensors that are located on the inside here to pick up neuromagnetic signals and so forth. Now what about the transverse field? Okay, this is this is the axial field. What about the sideways field? Okay. All right, so I've modeled this, the helmet here in XY symmetry. Okay, and that once again, this would simulate the axial field. And I want to look at the transverse field. So I'm going to go ahead and change the boundary conditions. Okay. Zero tangential field on the left and the right. Okay.
So you can see the problem again with the transverse field. We have very poor screening of transverse field here. So we'd like to improve this by putting an extra mu metal layer here to um, try to get some of the transverse field to channel around. Let's see if we can do that with this particular example. Let me zoom in here a little bit more. Okay. In order to do this, uh, I need to increase my, uh, put another layer here. Okay. And I will stick in a half arc, 180 degrees. Okay. Let me zoom in here a little bit. So we're going to call this mu metal. Okay. Let's rebuild our mesh. Okay. Now I'm going to give this 10 to the 4 permeability. Is that a mu metal? Okay. And let's solve the problem here. Okay. So we have a lot fewer flux lines that are penetrating the helmet here. So if we wanted to to screen both axial and transverse fields for an application like this, it would be good to have a permeable region uh, to channel the transverse fields, whereas the superconductor is more effective at channeling the axial fields here. Okay, And if you wanted to get the exact solution, we can look at uh, in axial symmetry here. So let me go ahead and open that example just to show you. We can do this if you want to get actual signal to noise ratios and so forth. Okay. So once again, this is our combination mu metal superconducting bowl, but now this is in axial symmetry. And this is, shows the, uh, the axial field here. So if you wanted to calculate the signal to noise ratio of the, the shield, you could calculate uh, for a given dipole source that would, rec would correspond to some neuromagnetic signal inside of the shield. Uh, you could calculate the field with and without this, the shield present and calculate the improvement in signal to noise ratio. Okay. Now, about the signal to noise ratio, the signal to noise ratio you can calculate with the shield and also calculate the signal to noise ratio without the shield. So you'll have a background noise field, and you'll have some dipole source field. There will be some improvement in signal to noise ratio that you can calculate as the ratio of these two SNRs. Okay, so it's possible that the shield is going to attenuate the field that you're interested in, as well as the background noise field. So this is this figure of merit is really how beneficial a given shield is for uh, a certain application. 